All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Pierce, and I will be your trainer for today. Alongside of me, we have Sean. He'll be helping to answer any questions that you have as we go throughout our training today. And today we're going to be talking about Microsoft Teams. So before we dive into that, I do want to cover some of the resources that are going to be available to all of you as we go throughout our live training today. The first thing is closed captions. So this is a live event. So all of you are on about a five to 20 second delay, uh, depending on where you are. And that provides some time for us to create closed captions for all of you. So you can adjust these settings by selecting the gear icon at the bottom of your live stream view. And we'll have some settings in there where we can adjust our captioning options. And we'll take a look at those in just a second. What we also have available on this page is the option to have uh, we can pause or adjust our volume at the bottom left hand corner of the stream view and if we rewind during the live event today we can always return to the live portion by selecting the live option so you can rewind in our training today to review any parts that you may have missed or that you'd like to see again and you can return to the live portion by selecting our option right here when we select the gear that will bring us to a page where we can adjust things like our playback speed. So if you'd like to go back and review anything, you can always slow it down as well to uh, really take it step by step. We can change some of our captions and subtitle options here and some specific settings about how they will look on our screen. We can also change our video quality. So if you are in a place with uh, less reliable internet, you can always adjust your stream quality to account for that. So when we select our captions and subtitle settings here, we'll be able to adjust our text size as well as our text color and any background transparency that we may uh, need. So we can take a little bit of time here at the beginning of our live event to ensure that we have everything set up properly and that we'll have a comfortable uh, live stream view today. And this is a live event, so it's going to be a little bit more of a one sided conversation, but we do have a Q&A area. And this is a perfect place to ask any questions that you may have or request for a redemonstration of a specific topic. We have some fantastic moderators here keeping an eye on all of those. They'll let me know if we have anything that we'd like to redemonstrate. We do have a lot of time here together today, so I highly recommend that you submit any questions that you have. Um, it will uh, kind of guide us towards maybe some areas that you're less experienced with or uh, some things that you may like to see. And speaking of that, uh, we'd love to know how experienced you are with Teams meetings. So uh, we'll give it a range of one to 10 on how experienced you are. One being I have never been in a Teams meeting, never even scheduled them. And 10 being I schedule meetings all the time and I'm pretty much a pro. Um, so go ahead and let us know in the Q&A how experienced you are with these meetings or maybe some resources that you like to use during your Teams meetings. We'd love to see that. So in our Q&A area here, we do have two categories. We have questions that you have asked, and then we have featured questions. And this is an area where we will create announcements or any important posts, or if we get some really good questions from some of you, uh, we'll post them here for others to see. So if you do have really good questions, be sure to ask those, and you might even see it in that featured section. You do have the option to enter your name, or you can uh, answer anonymously or post a question anonymously. Uh, one request that we do have is if you ask a question and you get a response, we request that you uh, have a follow-up question in the same thread. It will help to keep it more organized on our end, and then we can provide you some links or additional resources if the situation kind of needs that. So if you do get a response and you have a follow-up question, you're curious about maybe an additional feature, um, please reply in the same thread. It really helps us on the back end here. With that said, we'll jump right into our training for today and start talking about our agenda and what Teams meetings actually are. So we'll go through our, our PowerPoint here. We'll talk about what Teams are or what Teams meetings are, uh, some of the features that are built into our Teams meetings and how Teams helps us have the best meeting experience. We'll talk about our meeting life cycle. What I mean by that is before our meeting, during our meeting and after our meeting because each of these steps have really crucial resources that we can use to help facilitate a productive Teams meeting. And finally, we will provide some time at the end for any questions that you may have or uh, certain redemonstrations if we uh, couldn't really fit those into the middle of our training today. 
Uh, we do, like I said, we do have a lot of time together today, so feel free to ask any questions. Uh, we'll probably have enough time to get to all of them. So uh, with that said, we will go ahead and jump into the first part of our agenda here, which is introducing Teams meetings. So we're going to approach our Teams meetings from the perspective of really Teams as a whole, because we can't look at one resource of Teams without bringing in all of our other resources. And that's really what Teams is about bringing in resources that we use every day into one place so that we spend less time searching for resources and more time using them. And what Teams Meetings allows us to do is meet anywhere so we can have access to all of our normal resources, whether we're at home, on the go, in a conference room, or in a classroom. We can have spontaneous scheduling for one-on-one -on -one conversations, or we can schedule out recurring meetings for long periods of time. And what's nice about these is that each instance of our meeting has different resources and different tools to help facilitate that type of discussion. We can have internal or external communication. So if you'd like to talk with people from uh, different colleges, we can have that available and they don't even need to have Teams installed. What's nice is all you need to do is add their email and they'll get an invite and they'll be able to join your Teams meeting or any conversations that you'd like. Teams meetings also allow us to meet with intelligence. So that goes back to that, um, that idea that each instance of a Teams meeting is kind of its own entity. Any resources that you have there, conversations or files will all be centered around that scheduled meeting. So it makes everything kind of connected. If we're meeting at one time to talk about a certain topic, it makes sense that any additional conversations or files that we create will be centered around that conversation and that meeting that initially helped us create those ideas. So we'll easily be able to go back and forth between our resources and even access them after our meeting is done. And finally, we can meet with confidence. Teams meetings allow us to connect from anywhere. Even if we're on a less stable Wi-Fi connection or cellular network, Teams will do its best to ensure that our video quality and our audio quality are going to be picture perfect. And if it can't make it picture perfect for us, it also provides some tools that we can adjust so that we can ensure that we have the best meeting experience possible. One of those tools is to turn off our incoming video. So that allows us to restrict our video usage and instead prioritize our audio connection. So even if we are on less stable Wi-Fi or maybe we just don't wanna burn through our monthly data limit on our cell phone, we can limit the amount of data that Teams is using and still have the same collaborative and productive features that a Teams meeting allows. And what's nice about Teams, as I've mentioned a little bit, is we can meet from anywhere. So we can see uh, or we can meet across our desktop in a meeting room or a classroom or even in our mobile devices. And I believe all of you will be receiving uh, devices in the future that will have all of your office applications installed on them. So what's nice about that is no matter where you are, whether you're on a desktop at home, you're on a laptop on the go or a, a mobile device like a tablet or a phone, you'll have relatively the same experience across all of your team's applications. There are some subtle changes that might be available on one device versus another, but pretty much across the board, our resources are going to be the same. And that makes it really nice because we can access all of our resources, interact with others in relatively the same way, uh, regardless of what device we're using. Even if we're on a computer that isn't ours, we can access Teams on the web and ensure that we can still attend our meetings, have conversations, and even open up our office files from anywhere. All right, taking a look at some of our feedback here, looks like, we looks like we have a pretty wide range of experience with Teams meetings, from uh, never been to one, never set one up, to it looks like we have a couple of nines in here, to uh, I've scheduled meetings all the time and are basically a pro. So if you have experienced uh, Teams meetings before and we're going throughout our training today, maybe um, put in some ideas about how you use certain features or um, maybe if you have never thought to use a certain feature that way, uh, let us know in the Q&A and we'd love to get your feedback on that. All right, so the last thing that I'd like to talk about here before we dive into our live demo is our meeting life cycle. The meeting life cycle is a really important thing to keep in mind as we're scheduling and talking about our team's meetings because our life cycle is really in, in three stages. 
It's before our meeting has started, during our meeting, and then a post meeting. And these three stages have different resources that we can take advantage of to help facilitate our meeting. So before our meeting, we can set up things like document links or uh, have a conversation in the chat feed. We can collaborate on documents and presentations before our meeting even starts and then continue working on them when our meeting begins. During our meeting, we have access to the same conversations that we had available before. So we can continue conversations, we can share our screen, and we can even allow others to control our screen uh, via our Teams application if you're using the desktop app. In post-meeting, we still have access to all of those conversations and files that were created during our meeting. Even if we make them a recurring meeting, we'll still have access to those discussions from previous days. So if we schedule a meeting on Monday and it goes every day until Friday, we can have our meeting on Friday uh, revolve around reflection for the rest of the week or the past week, where we can look back on each day's notes, each day's documents, and talk about some goals that we may have wanted to achieve and whether or not that happened. So we can have these, uh, these series of meetings, look back on any resources that we create and have a better insight into how productive we're being or if we've covered everything that we'd like to. During our meeting, we do have some really advanced features such as sharing our desktop. We can put through uh, audio from our computer and we even have some different choices when it comes to sharing content that can really affect um, our privacy as well as how coherently we can share data in our, our Teams meeting. And we'll talk about that a little bit later once we jump into our live demo. Uh, and finally, the last part here, as we've highlighted a little bit before, Teams tries to do its best to ensure that we have the clearest Teams meeting possible. Uh, and that, that also means providing resources to help people focus during a meeting. Because a meeting isn't just about having our internet connection. We need to ensure that we have a clear background, uh, that there isn't a lot of distraction, and Teams provides tools like blurring our background video to help focus and eliminate distractions and really highlight that high definition video that we're putting through. So with that said, uh, we're gonna jump into our live demo for today. And before we do that, I do wanna check in with our moderators here and see if we have any questions before we continue. We're dealing with a couple technical hiccups, but nothing too major in terms of presentation. I think you're doing fine. Perfect, okay. Well, with that said, we'll jump right into our live demo for today. And to start with, we are in our desktop environment of Teams. So if we open up Teams here, uh, we're gonna start by talking about how we can schedule our meetings within Teams and within Outlook, because we do have both of these options available, and there will be some resources that are um, better suited for our Teams versus Outlook, and some features that are only available in Outlook that we might want to use. So we'll talk about both of these, and kind of the pros and cons of each. To start scheduling our meetings in our Teams application, we can either select the specific time frame that we'd like to schedule it for, or we can select the new Teams meeting option at the top of our page. I prefer to select this specific time frame so that I can see the meeting that I'm scheduling relative to maybe other events that are already on my schedule. And we can schedule a time frame in half hour segments by simply selecting it, or if we'd like to have it for longer than a half hour, we can click and drag to schedule it for a longer period of time. I'll schedule hours from, let's see, 9 to 11 today, so the time that we will have together. And when we select our time frame, we will be brought into our Teams invitation page. And we'll need to add some information here. The first thing that we need to add is a title. So we'll call this our uh, morning meeting. And next we need to add attendees. And there are two categories that we can add people to when it comes to attendees. I'll zoom in a little bit more to give you a better view. Uh, there are required attendees and there are optional attendees. The key difference between these two is how they will appear on your calendar when you accept the invitation. If you're added as a required attendee, then the time frame will show as busy on your calendar. If you're added as an optional attendee, then the time frame will show as tentative on your calendar. 
This not only helps you as a meeting organizer know who is required to be at your meeting versus who is optional to be there, but it helps other people in your organization know whether you may be busy during a certain time, meaning that you're added as a required attendee to a meeting, or whether you might have some free time, meaning that you've been optionally added to a meeting and there might be another meeting that's more important that you have to attend during this time. So it helps it helps really everyone uh, know where you should be, whether or not you have some free time and uh, give clarity to possible scheduling events in the future. So I will go ahead and add a required attendee here and I will add um, Alex. And as an optional attendee, I will add uh, Sean. Next, we can confirm that our time frame is set correctly which we had selected that before from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m., so it should be good. We can set this to an all-day event if we'd like to, and we can make this a recurring meeting. If we set our recurrence for our meeting, then we can have this based on every weekday, daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, or custom. So we can really adjust how we'd like these recurrences to go uh, and when we can access them. And finally, one of the features that we have available only within our Teams application is the ability to invite a channel. And inviting a channel can be useful because it will essentially allow everyone to, uh, to access this meeting, at least anyone that has access to the channel that we're inviting. So for example, if I were to add a channel here and say I wanted algebra to be a part of my meeting here, I could select the general channel in algebra and now anyone who has access to the general channel in algebra will be able to join my meeting and any conversations or files that are created during this meeting will be saved in the general channel of algebra so that others can look back and um, and see those resources. So adding a channel to a meeting is essentially the same as copying the email addresses of everyone who's a part of this team and then pasting them in the attendee links here. And finally, when we're scheduling our meetings, we want to be sure that we're selecting the correct time for them and that it will work for everyone within our meeting. So to do that, we can use the scheduling assistant at the top of our page. The scheduling assistant will allow us to see the schedules of everyone who we're inviting and whether or not they have free time. We can drag this slider around to select a time frame that might work better for other people. So for example, it looks like uh, I and Alex have some, uh, some events on our calendar. However, they are tentative. So tentative events are represented by the dashed spaces here. If it were a busy event, then it would be a solid colored block. And this allows us to see the availability of each person broken down between required attendees and optional attendees. So we can adjust our time frame here to ensure that the most number of required attendees can attend and ideally as many optional attendees as we can get. So for our time frame, we'll go ahead and select 9 to 10 a.m. or 9 to 11 a.m. here. And even though I am tentative and Alex is tentative, that's okay because this meeting is going to take precedent over that. So we wanna make sure that we are at this meeting. So we can still, um, we can still select this time and it should be good to go. So now I can double check everything uh, looks good. We'll go ahead and send out this invite and uh, we can continue with our meeting. And I do see a question here. Um, so everyone in the situation that we are creating right now, they are being invited to the meeting and uh, yes. So they will be able to uh, to see this meeting and actually I'll go ahead and um, We'll create two meetings. We'll hop, we'll create one designated for Teams and one from Outlook so we can see the differences there. So I'll go ahead and create our one for Teams. And now that we have that, we can go directly to our algebra channel in the general channel here and we see that post for our meeting that was created. So anyone will be able to join your meeting from here by selecting the event and then selecting join. And any conversations that we have before our meeting can be held here. Any documents that we create during our meeting will also be held in this post and can be accessed via the files tab in our general channel. 
So we've talked a little bit about creating our Teams meetings in Teams. I do want to spend a little bit of time creating a Teams meeting via Outlook because we do have some resources there that can help us facilitate a more um, advanced Teams meeting. So to start with, we will navigate to our Outlook application which I have mine pinned at the bottom here, but we can access it by going to our start menu and then selecting any letter and then navigating to O. We'll find Outlook installed there. If you don't see Outlook um, available here, then you probably don't have it installed, at which point you would want to go to portal.office.com and log in with your school credentials. You should be able to download the full Office suite there as well as Teams. So if you don't have Office already set up, um, I would recommend doing that. And again, that is portal.office.com and log in with your standard school credentials. That should get everything connected for you. So when we select Outlook here, we will be brought into our email space and we want to schedule a meeting. So we'll navigate down to our calendar. And to begin scheduling a Teams meeting, we'll want to navigate up to our new Teams meeting option. This will ensure that we are actually creating a Teams meeting and we'll have all of the resources available to us. So we'll select it here. And we're going to give this a similar title to our, um, our options here. Oh yes, I did forget to mention um, that if you are on a Mac computer, uh, some of these options will look a little bit different. Uh, if you don't have the new Teams meeting option within uh, your Outlook application that should be available within the next month. Uh, just keep an eye out for any Office updates. They should be available to you relatively soon. Uh, I did forget to mention that. We did just get a question through here. So if you are on Mac, um, keep an eye out for those updates and try to update your Office as soon as possible to get all of these features. All right, so we are creating our Teams meeting here, and I'm going to give this a similar name to our other one but we will put Outlook at the end so we can see the difference between creating our Outlook meeting versus our Teams meeting that we added our channel to. And again, we'll want to add our required and optional attendees. I will add Alex again, and I'll add Sean again. Next, we'll want to ensure that we're creating our meeting for the correct time. Uh, within Outlook, it does tend to, um, to reset your time values here when you go to create a Teams meeting. So you will want to double check that you're scheduling your meeting for the correct time. All right, so we'll go ahead and schedule ours from, we'll do the same time frame, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. And we can set the, we can set this for all day. We can change our time zone as well as make this a recurring meeting. We can even set, uh, or what's nice about scheduling our meetings through Outlook is we have this reminders feature available. And this will remind everyone that we have invited to our meeting uh, the selected amount of time before that our meeting will be starting soon. So for example, this one would remind our attendees 15 minutes before it starts that our meeting will be starting and it's a subtle hint that they should start to wrap up whatever they're working on and prepare for our meeting to start. Now, if you are using Outlook, you will have reminders turned on by default. However, we can adjust our custom reminder here, um, and that will also ensure that anyone who is using Teams will also have that reminder available. So this is a feature that we will only have available through Outlook, and it will ensure that everyone will receive that reminder. One of the other options that we have available when it comes to creating a Teams meeting is we can attach meeting notes. And what this allows us to do is connect to a OneNote notebook that we may have created. And we can share these notes out with anyone that is a part of our meeting. So if we had created a notebook here, we had our quick notes and say, I just wanted to attach uh, this document here. I could select OK, and now two links will be created, one for the desktop and one for the web. That way, no matter where our attendees are joining from, they'll be able to access any links or resources that we are attaching to our meeting invitation. And the final thing that we can adjust when creating a meeting through Outlook is we can set our meeting options. The meeting options are going to be very important to how our meeting is going to run overall. 
When we select our link, a new web page will be open here, and we'll be able to change some settings related to how our meeting will run. The first couple of options that we have here are related to the lobby. The lobby is an in-between space that people can be added to when they have tried to join but have not successfully been admitted into our meeting. And we have a choice between allowing only people in our organization, we can allow everyone, or we can select only ourselves. If we select only me, then this will be, uh, then we will need to be the person to start our meeting and begin admitting people from the lobby. The other options that we have here are related to callers or using dial-in numbers. Now, all of you do have dial-in numbers available. Uh, so if you do uh, want to adjust some settings related to people who are using those dial-in numbers, such as whether they can bypass the lobby or an announcement is made when they leave or join, we can adjust those settings here as well. And these next two settings are related to uh, the roles that someone has during our meeting. The first one is related to who can present. And the presenter role is a role that is, uh, basically they can do whatever they'd like to within our meeting. They can remove people from our meeting, share their screen, uh, mute people, or change other people's roles. And by default, everyone will be assigned to the presenter role. But we can restrict this to specific people, only people in our organization, or only me if we'd like to. And if we set this to only me, then anyone who is added to our meeting or tries to join will be added as an attendee. And the attendee is the second role that someone can have within a meeting. So there are presenters and attendees. And attendees will have a lot more restrictions placed on them during our meeting. They will not be able to share their screen, mute other people, admit people from the lobby, or remove people from our meeting. And another restriction that we can place on them is whether or not they can use their microphone. So if we select this option here, then their microphone will be deactivated and they will not be able to come off of mute during our meeting. This can be useful if we have a very large meeting space that um, we don't necessarily want people coming off of mute whenever they'd like to. We do have options for allowing meeting chats and reactions if we'd like to as well. So we can go ahead and select save. And what's nice about Teams meetings is that they are all cloud-based. So we can always update these settings even after we've sent out an invitation. It's as simple as reloading our invitation and then selecting our meeting options again. And to review where those are, we can find them at the bottom of our Outlook invitation. All right, so we have added our title. We've added our required attendees. Uh, we have it set for the correct time and reminder. We've added any resources that we'd like to and ensured that our meeting options are set up properly. We should be good to send out this invitation. If we'd like to verify that our time frame is going to work for everyone, we do have that scheduling assistant available in Outlook as well. So we'll see that same time frame with our required attendees and optional attendees listed here. So everything looks good. We'll go ahead and send out this invitation and we should be good to go. All right, so now that we have created this meeting or these meetings uh, the, to both of them, really, uh, I want to talk about how we can join our meetings. And there's a couple of different ways that we can. The first way that we can join our meetings is by selecting the specific meeting in our reminder page here. So I can select either our Outlook meeting or our Teams meeting and then select join online. Alternatively, if I go to my Outlook calendar, I can right click on any meeting that is here and then select join Teams meeting. Within our Teams application on our calendar, we will also see the same meetings available here. And when we see our meetings here, we will have the option to join that meeting if we are within five minutes of our meeting start time, or if we have multiple meetings scheduled at the same time here, we will want to right click on our meeting and then select join online. But this is also the place where we can begin chatting with participants before our meeting has started. So I could select chat with participants and I could begin having a conversation here. I can have a conversation with our Outlook meeting. Others could then send messages back and react if they'd like to. 
And the same thing goes for our Teams meeting, the one that we created in our Teams application that had our channel invite. So if we go back to our calendar, we can right click on our Teams one as well and chat with participants. But if you notice, this one will bring us to our general channel in Algebra because that is the channel that we invited. So we can still have conversations before, but they'll be hosted on our channel and will be public to everyone when, uh, when we join. All right, so if we'd like to join our meeting, we can right click on it and then select join online. And I'm going to join our Outlook one so that we can take a look at some of the meeting options uh, that we put in place. If we'd like to adjust any of the meeting options related to our Teams meeting, we can right click on it or just select it and then select edit. And here is where our meeting options will be available. So this will open up the same exact page where we can adjust our settings for a meeting created in Teams. So again, that can be found right here. So we'll go ahead and join our Outlook meeting here. So we'll right click on it or just simply select it uh, and then select join. And that will bring us to a place that I like to call the dressing room. And this is where we can configure all of the devices that our computer will be using, such as our camera and our microphone and speaker. And we have a lot of different options here. We can select the gear option to get a better view of our specific speaker, microphone and camera that we may be using or change the device depending on what we need. So this space allows us to ensure that everything will be picture perfect when we are joining our meeting. We even have the option to select different subcategories of audio devices. And one of the ones that I would like to talk about specifically is the don't use audio option. This is a good option if you are using two devices for the same meeting in the same room. And what you'd want to do is select don't use audio on the device that you would like to have only a video feed on. And then on the other device that you'll be using as your microphone and speaker, you would select the use computer audio or just your standard audio device. And that way you won't have a microphone on on both devices and you won't have the possibility of any echo from the same uh, device in the same room. So if you are going to be using a more advanced setup like that, select don't use audio. But for a majority of the time, we will be selecting our computer audio here. So we'll go with that one for today. And now we will go ahead and join our Teams meeting. Now, currently we are the only one in our meeting. And that is because we are waiting for people to try to join like this. So it looks like Sean and Alex are trying to join our meeting. And we have the option to either admit each person when they try to join, or if multiple people try to join, we can select view lobby. And this will bring us to a participants menu where we can see uh, a list of everyone who is trying to join. And we have the option to either admit or decline their request for, uh, for admittance. We also have the option to admit everyone if there are multiple people trying to join at one time. I will go ahead and admit everyone so that they can join our meeting. And if you notice, they are automatically added to this attendee category. And that's because of the choice that we made a little bit earlier, where anyone who joins is automatically made an attendee and their microphone is disconnected. Now, before we get too far away from things, I do want to talk about some of the, uh, the general organization and layout within our team's meetings. So at the very top left corner of our team's meeting, we have a timer. And this timer is going to be relevant in a couple of different cases. One of those is uh, any recordings that you have of your meeting and any attendance lists that are generated during your meeting. So it's important to know that as long as this timer is going, we are in one single instance of our meeting. As soon as we end our meeting or everyone leaves, this timer restarts and we have a separate instance of our meeting. So any recordings and attendance lists will be different. And I'll highlight specifically what I mean by that a little bit later, but just keep an eye on this timer as we go throughout our meeting to know whether or not we have transitioned to a new one or uh, we're still in the same meeting. All right. 
Uh, so now that we have created our meeting, we have some people added here. Uh, I want to talk about some of the resources that are available to us as we go throughout our team's meeting. And the first way that we can communicate within our meeting is, of course, with our camera and our microphone. These are going to be our standard ways of communication that all of us are, are pretty used to in an online environment. However, there may be situations where uh, it's not necessarily useful to use our camera or our microphone. For example, if there's a conversation that was already happening, we don't necessarily want to interrupt that conversation. So we need a way of letting others know that we have something that we'd like to add to the conversation without necessarily interrupting it. And that's where the ability to raise our hand comes into play. When you raise our hand, our specific user profile will be highlighted in yellow like this. And a hand raise icon will be listed at the top, showing someone's name, and we'll have a hand raise icon next to our name at the bottom. We will also see that people have their hand raised in our participants menu. Uh, and it, lo it looks like we have a question here about what do the red dots mean next to uh, the attendees. That simply means that they are busy, so it's showing their status. If we hover over that status, it shows that they are in a call, and uh, this will change depending on whether you are in a call or you're available. Um, you can change your status on your own. So it just shows your, your respective status to others. Uh, so now that our attendees have their hand raised, uh, we know that they have something that they'd like to say. However, their microphones are uh, disconnected. So this is actually where an additional benefit of raising your hand can come into play. Because if our attendees have their hand raised, and their microphones are disconnected, then we can call on them one by one and we can allow them to unmute. So we can allow our attendees to unmute and uh, that way they can come off of mute, say whatever they'd like to say or ask any questions. And we still haven't really changed their permissions all that much. We've just given them the ability to use their microphone. So it's a nice in-between of having people in the attendee role with no communication, meaning their microphone is disconnected, and giving them full presenter status where they can remove people from the meeting or share their screen. It's a nice in-between. And we can always revoke that access by selecting the ellipses next to their name. If someone came off of mute and forgot to uh, lower their hand, we can select the ellipses next to their name and select lower hand, and that will lower their hand for them. Within this menu, we also have the option to change some video settings related to our meeting. And specifically, the first option that we have here is the ability to pin someone's video. And when we pin someone's video, it will make that person front and center for us personally. It will not affect the video feed of anyone else within our meeting. Alternatively, if we select the spotlight option, that will highlight this person's video and make them front and center for everyone in the meeting. So now this will affect other people's video feed and they will see this person listed front and center for their meeting. They uh, won't be able to see anyone else or anyone else within our meeting will be listed at the bottom. And this is a good use case if you have someone like an ASL interpreter or um, you have a specific presenter or even a project manager that you'd like to be uh, the center of attention during your meeting. And we can always update this. We can stop spotlighting someone and then begin spotlighting someone else if we'd like to change that. A couple of other options that we have in this space is the ability to change someone's role. So we can make someone a presenter if we'd like to which will give them the ability to admit people from our lobby, share their screen, um, mute other people, as well as remove people from our meeting. And we can always change this back whenever we'd like to. And the last option that we have in this menu is to remove someone from our meeting. This will simply remove that person, and if they try to rejoin, they will need to go through our lobby and any other security policies that we may have in place. One of the other useful features in our participants menu is the ability to download an attendance list. And this is something that is only available to the meeting organizer. So the person that set up our meeting and invited everyone to it. And when we download an attendance list, 
an Excel document will be created and we'll be able to select it here. And this will show some information about our meeting, such as who has joined or left and when that action happened. And this list will be comprehensive as long as our meeting runtime here is still going. So the Excel document that we're looking at will show the actions taken, meaning people joining or leaving, uh, the respective time frame that that happened, and it will have all of that information for as long as this timer has been running. If we restart our meeting and this goes back to zero, then our attendance list will reflect that and it will have different times and different actions depending on that new meeting. Just a All question right. from the Q&A real quick. When yeah. you're spotlighting somebody, you can still see the content that's being shared via the content tray, correct? Um, I believe so. Uh, yeah, if you're spotlighting someone's video, I believe um, shared content will still take priority over that. But after, the, after content is done being shared, then that person will go back to being um, the front video feed. Okay, um, are there any other questions before we continue? That was my only one, thank you. Perfect. All right, so uh, now that we have covered some, uh, some of the different ways that we can address our participants and uh, the hand raising feature, I wanna talk about some of the other ways that we can communicate within our meeting. So we do have our standard camera and microphone. We can raise our hand to let others know that we have something that we'd like to say or we can communicate via the chat. And the chat is nice because we can send those messages before our meeting actually starts. We can uh, send messages during, and we can even access these after. Uh, when we are in our chat here, we can send different types of messages such as GIFs. We can attach documents from our computer or from our OneDrive or we can use our advanced formatting option here to get access to things like bold, italics, or underline. And if we select the ellipses here, we can add even more features, such as decreasing or increasing indent, adding bulleted or numbered lists, as well as if we were to scroll down here, uh, we can insert a table or uh, insert columns or rows to help represent different data. This makes it really easy to send effective messages or clearly provide resources in one single message. We don't need to send multiple messages to convey our point. We can use some of these features to ensure that one message really gets our point across or clearly provides some resources. And any messages that we send here will be available to others outside of our meeting, even if they haven't actually joined yet. All right, so uh, the next thing that I would like to talk about is uh, sharing content within our meeting. And this is a really important part because uh, it's, it's a tool that we use pretty frequently throughout any team's meeting. So to begin sharing content in our meeting, we can select the share content option here where a new menu will open up and we'll have some choices to make about how we can, or what type, of, what type of content we're going to be sharing. The first option that we have is whether we want to include our computer audio. So when we select this, it will put through any audio that is playing on our computer so that others will be able to hear it, whether that's an online video or a, um, an audio recording as a part of a PowerPoint. It will ensure that any audio that's playing on our computer will be available for others. And the next option that we have is choosing between a desktop or a specific window to share. And there are pros and cons to each of these. So I'll be going through each of them individually and showing what it looks like from our presenter side, as well as our attendee side, uh, and some of the impacts that choosing one over the other can have. So to begin, we will start sharing our desktop. And when we share our desktop, as the name might suggest, everything that is available on our desktop will be visible to others. So I'm going to change our view here so that we can get a look of our meeting from our presenter side as well as our attendee side.
All right, so in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, we have our presenter view. And in the rest of our screen, we have our attendee view. And we can see as a presenter, I can open up any additional windows that I'd like to, and others in our team meeting will be able to see that. I can go to my start menu and show exactly what I'm doing and others will be able to follow along. So this is actually the view that all of you are seeing right now. Uh, what this allows us to do is easily switch between multiple windows at a time without needing to stop sharing content and start sharing again. The only downside to sharing your entire desktop is that, uh, well, you'll be sharing your entire desktop. So any windows that you open or notifications that you receive will be visible to others within your meeting. So we'll have less privacy, but we'll have the ability to switch between different types of content without needing to stop sharing and start sharing again. I'm going to switch back to our presenter view again here so we can take a look at our next option. So within our meeting, we have a, another option for sharing content. We can select a specific window. I'll select my calendar for Outlook to begin sharing with our participants. When I select our calendar, that specific window will be highlighted in red, as we can see here. And that signals to me as the meeting uh, sharer that this is the content that is being shared and anything outside of this red outline will not be visible. I'm going to change our view again so we can see what this looks like from our participants view. So again, we have our, uh, our organizer or our presenter at the bottom left and our attendee is in the rest of our screen. And what's nice about sharing a specific window is that that is the only content that is being shared. So as a presenter, we can open up other windows if we'd like to, or even uh, completely overlap our window of Outlook and others within our meeting will only see the content that we've shared. So we have this ability to multitask between different windows and ensure that the attendees in our meeting will only see the window that we have selected to share. And that also goes for any notifications. So if we receive notifications on our computer, those will not be visible to other attendees and they won't be able to see any additional windows that we open up, even if they're on top of the window that we're sharing. What's nice about sharing content in any Teams meeting, whether that is a desktop or a specific window, is that our attendees can zoom in on the content that we're sharing. By using the control and scroll wheel combination, we can zoom in on content and ensure that we have the best view of anything that's being shared. This also makes it nice for us as a meeting presenter because we don't have to worry about whether our information on our screen is perfectly formatted for everyone. Everyone has the ability to zoom in on any content that they'd like to focus on and maybe get a better view of. So we don't have to worry about formatting it. Teams really allows each individual person to tailor their viewing experience to see specifically the information that they would like to. This will not affect the view of anyone else in our meeting. It will only zoom in information for us. So it makes it really useful. Uh, the only downside of sharing a specific window within our team's meeting is that we will need to stop sharing and start sharing again if we'd like to switch content. So as a meeting presenter, uh, switching back to our presenter view here, if I'd like to switch the window that I'm sharing, I will need to open up our meeting again, stop sharing, and then start sharing again and select a separate window. This is a very deliberate process for security purposes. There isn't any pause functionality, so it completely removes the possibility of you selecting the wrong window to share or possibly oversharing content that you didn't mean to. It's a very deliberate process to stop sharing, select a new window, and then begin sharing again. Uh, we did get a couple of questions in here of how do you zoom in again. Uh, you can use the control and scroll wheel combination, or if you're on a laptop with a trackpad, I believe it is control and a two finger swipe should do it. Um, However you can scroll on your computer trackpad, you'll just want to use control and then that standard um, scrolling option, however you have it configured. And that will allow you to zoom in or out of any content that someone is sharing. Speaking of content that someone is sharing, uh, we have a couple of other options available to us within our meeting. The first is we can share a whiteboard. And the whiteboard is a really useful tool for collaborating digitally. So when we select our whiteboard here, a whiteboard will be created in our uh, meeting space. 
And this is something that is available to everyone in our meeting. So everyone within our meeting will be able to select this whiteboard depending on whether we want to present or collaborate. I'll go ahead and allow collaboration so that others can um, can edit this space with me. But I can also revoke that access by going to the gear here and changing whether our participants can edit. And now that we have the space open, anyone would be able to grab a pen, add content to the space, or even add things like sticky notes or change their color, depending on the type of content that it's representing. So we have this, this whiteboard space that we can zoom in or out of using those, screen, those same control and zoom options. And we can even rearrange it to get a better view of our information. Now, our whiteboard space is a place where we'll be brainstorming a lot of different ideas. And most likely, we'll want to look back on these, uh, this information. So we can actually save an image of our whiteboard to access later. And I'm going to format our data in a really weird way right now, uh, but I'm going to do that intentionally. So most of the information that we have added is now off of our screen. We see a little bit of our post-it note here, and uh, we have some drawings here, but mostly it's kind of extraneous white space. So if we wanted to export an image of our whiteboard, we can select the gear option at the top of our page and then select export image. This will export a PNG image to our downloads folder. And when we open this up, I'm going to change our theme here real quick just to highlight um, our contrast here a little bit. This won't really impact anything. Um, it'll just make our view of our, our image look a little bit better. So when we open up our whiteboard image that has been downloaded, we will see that Teams has done a lot of work for us. It is automatically zoomed in on the information that we have added. It has cropped out all of that extraneous white space and ensured that we have the best view possible of the content that we have added. Because it makes sense that the information that we add is actually what's valuable here. And we want that to be front and center for us. What also may, what's also really nice about this is if we have really large scale uh, whiteboards, meaning that we have a lot of different diagrams. These go on for a while. And maybe to get a comprehensive view of everything, we have to zoom out a lot. We have a lot of information. Maybe we have some charts here. What's nice about this is Teams will automatically zoom in on that information so that if we need to zoom in even more, we will still have a high resolution image that won't be distorted or blurry. So even for really wide, um, kind of expansive whiteboards, we'll still have the ability to zoom in with clarity and see any information that was written down or typed. All right, so the last option that we have when it comes to sharing content in our meeting is we can select a PowerPoint. When we select a PowerPoint, we can select one that has already been uploaded to Teams, or we can select the Browse option here to upload one from our computer or share one from OneDrive. I'll select one that is already here and begin presenting it to our meeting. So what this will do is open up our presentation and begin presenting it to everyone that is in attendance they will be able to see this presentation and they'll have the option to move through it on their own. By default, people will be able to move through the presentation on their own. They won't need to stay on the same slide that I am. However, as a meeting organizer and presenter, we have the option to force our participants to move through our shared presentation on, uh, at the same pace that we are. So if we select our eye icon right here, this will prevent our participants from moving through our presentation on their own ensuring that whatever slide I am on, they are also viewing. This is a good idea if you want to present specific talking points on your meeting and ensure that others are actually seeing the same content that you are showing and narrating to. So I'll change our view again here so we see our attendee and presenter view. And currently, our attendees are able to move through the presentation on their own. So they could be on slide two here while I am on slide one and vice versa. However, if I selected the eye icon, that will force everyone to go to the same slide as me, and when I change slides, they will also change slides. 
when we are presenting a uh, a PowerPoint, we also have the option to uh, to give control of our presentation to allow others to navigate through and show certain uh, certain slides. So I'll select stop presenting here and uh, we'll return to our main presenter mode. Uh, at this point, I do want to check in with our moderators again, see if there are any questions that we have before we continue. Just working on a couple uh, technical things. The short, uh, the shortest question was, how do I zoom in and out? And I thought I had given a concise answer, but maybe you can address it better. Yeah, so, so zooming in on content is going to be available uh, whenever something is currently being shared. So if I were to share our window of Outlook here, and I'll change our view again to go to our presenter and uh, attendee view, we can zoom in on any content. If you're uh, using a mouse that has a scroll wheel, then you can use the control and scroll wheel option for forward and back to zoom in. If you're using a trackpad, then you'll need to determine how you would normally scroll through something like say a web page if you use two fingers to scroll through a web page whether that's up or down uh, side to side however you have that configured you want to use the control and then um, that that sort of scroll option on your trackpad if none of those work for you um, try the control and plus or minus combination that should also zoom in any content that is being shared but you want to make sure that you select in your presentation window and then use the control plus or minus options, because if you don't, sometimes it will zoom in your entire team's UI, like uh, like I'm doing here, instead of just the content. So make sure that you select the window first of the content that's being shared, and then you should be able to control plus or minus. Thank you, that was more comprehensive than my answer. <laughs> no, uh, no worries. All right, so, we, uh, let's see here. Um, when it comes to our Teams meetings here, we also have some breakout rooms available. Uh, breakout rooms are a really useful feature for allowing people to have their sort of own space to work in. And breakout rooms are only available or can only be started by our meeting organizer and are only available on our desktop version of the application. You can still attend a breakout room on any platform, but to begin opening breakout rooms, you do need to do that from a desktop application. Um, I do see a question here about um, the add a channel feature for our meeting. Um, I will be reviewing that in the, uh, in the next couple of minutes once we hop over to our Teams version of our meeting. So I will be covering that in just a, a couple of minutes. Um, so regarding our breakout rooms, we can begin creating breakout rooms by selecting the breakout rooms option here. And here we will have the option to choose how many rooms we'd like to create, ranging from one to 50, and how we, how we would like people assigned. So we can have them automatically assigned where it will average the number of people that we have to the number of rooms so that we get an equal number of people across all of our rooms or we can manually assign people to uh, create a more customized approach. When we select create rooms, our rooms will be created and we will have the option to manually assign our participants. We can do so by selecting their names and then selecting assign and choosing the room that we'd like to assign them to. When we've created these, we now have the option to change some settings related to the room by selecting the ellipses next to its name, where we can open a room one by one, we can rename a room, or we can delete it altogether. If we'd like to change settings related to our breakout rooms as a whole, we can select the ellipses at the top of our breakout rooms page and then navigate to room settings. And here we'll have two options available to us. We can choose to automatically move our participants to their breakout rooms, and we can also give the option for our participants to return to our main meeting on their own. I'll turn both of these on for today so we can see the impact of each of them and the options that it makes available. Now, normally we would spend an entire hour talking about breakout rooms because there is a lot of nuance to them. Um, I do wanna make sure that we cover all of our topics today, so we'll kind of do a brief overview of breakout rooms um, and we'll continue on from there.
All right, so we have our breakout rooms created. Now we're going to start our breakout rooms and that will open them. I'm going to switch our view again so we can see what it looks like from our presenter view as well as our attendee view to not only open our breakout rooms and send people to them, but what it appears like to be sent to a breakout room. So I'll change our view again here. And again, just to review, we have our presenter in the bottom left hand corner and we have our attendees on the rest of our screen. So in our presenter view, I'm going to start our rooms and open them. That is going to automatically transition our attendees to their respective room because we put that option in place. And it will also give them a notification that their breakout session has started and that they'll automatically be moved in about 10 seconds. Once they are moved to their breakout room, we will see that our original meeting is considered empty. And that's because our breakout room is technically counted as a separate meeting that is connected to our main one that we created. So within our breakout room, our attendees will be able to share their screen, communicate, collaborate, do really whatever they'd like to do. And when they're done, if we've allowed it, they can select the return option here to return to their main meeting. Or as a meeting organizer, I can close the rooms and that will bring everyone back as well. When we bring everyone back, if you notice, they will automatically regain their attendee status. So when we sent them to a breakout room, uh, they were currently assigned as attendees, but then once they officially joined their breakout room, they become presenters. So they have full access to do whatever they would like to. Here, I'll transition back so we get a little bit better view of what I'm showing here. Um, so when we send them to their breakout room, they are currently attendees. So they can't share their screen or come off of mute. Once they officially join their breakout room, they become presenters. So they can share their screen, they can come off of mute and collaborate however they'd like to. And once we bring them back from their breakout rooms, they will automatically regain their attendee status. So their microphones will be disconnected again. They won't be able to share their screen. Uh, we don't have to worry about manually changing back those settings when, uh, when they return from their breakout rooms. Teams will take care of that for us. Now, I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about our features available in the ellipses here, because this is where a lot of the smaller settings that affect our team's meetings can be found, or some additional resources, really. The first option that we have here are meeting devices. When we select this, it will be very similar to the screen that we saw when we initially joined our meeting. We can adjust our speaker, our microphone, and our camera to ensure that we're using the correct device. Within our meeting options here as well, or our ellipses, we can navigate to meeting options. And here is where we'll get that same list of options that we found when we are creating our meeting invitation, such as who can bypass the lobby, who can present, and whether our attendees can unmute. What's nice about this screen is we can change these settings and they will automatically update for everyone in our meeting. One of the ones that I use very frequently is adjusting this who can present option. Because if you remember, that is what made our attendees here automatically go to the attendee category when they joined. Since I was the only one who could be assigned as a presenter, Alex and Sean were automatically made attendees. But if I go into our meeting options and I change who can present to everyone and then select save, we will see that reflected in our participants menu. Now Alex and Sean are in the presenter status and they will be able to share their screen or use their microphone however they'd like. And I can easily change this back by doing the reverse and restricting who can present to only me. Then when I select save, it will automatically update and they will be added to that attendee category again. So it makes it really easy to control en masse uh, whether someone is an attendee or a presenter and uh, whether teams will just automatically manage that for us. Now, when we created our meeting invitation, we attached a OneNote resource. And we can find any links that are attached to our meeting invitation by selecting meeting details. And here's where we'll find those two links. So we can view our meeting notes in the desktop application, or we can view them on the web, depending on where we're accessing our Teams meeting from.
This is also where we'll find information for things like dial-in numbers. So if you'd like to share those out, you can find them under the meeting details category. The next options that we have here are related to our video setup. So the gallery will show up to uh, nine people organized in our view here. We can expand that for the large gallery view, which will show more than nine video feeds at one time, or we have this uh, together mode. Uh, the together mode will uh, allow everyone to kind of appear as if they're in the same room, and it's just a nice way to collaborate with people that gives us more of the feel of being back in the same place. We do have focus options, which is useful when someone is sharing content. Uh, so for example, if I were to make Alex here a presenter and they started sharing their screen, which I will have Alex do here briefly. All right, so we can see here that uh, Alex is sharing their screen. And if I would like to zoom in specifically on what Alex is sharing, then I can select the ellipses and select focus. And this will focus on any content that is currently being shared. So it will remove our bottom menu that shows other people's video feeds. And if we use this in combination with our full screen, then it will also remove our menu at the top allowing us a full screen view of any content that someone is sharing and uh, any windows that they may be opening up or interacting with. So we can also turn these off to revert back to our standard view. Continuing down our list here, we do have options for live captioning and recording. So when it comes to recording, you can select the start recording option and an icon will pop up at the top corner here. Once this turns red, we know that our meeting has started recording and we will be able to, uh, well, we should really let others know that they are being recorded. They'll see this notification saying that a recording has started, but we should really check with everyone before we start a recording to ensure that they're comfortable with it. But once we have it recording, uh, it will record everything that is happening on our screen, as well as anything that people are saying. And when we stop the recording, it will begin processing. And we'll be able to access that via our chat where the meeting recording is stored. And we can also access this, access this on our OneDrive. So if we navigate to our OneDrive, we can navigate to our recordings folder right here and any meeting recordings will be saved uh, and accessible here where we can share them out and, uh, and, and review them if we'd like to. We can also access them directly within our meeting chat by selecting it where a new window will open up and we will be able to, uh, to, to access our meeting invitation here or our, our meeting recording. We can select the ellipses next to our meeting recording and get a link to begin sharing it out immediately or select our option here to view it directly in our OneDrive. So you do have the option for meeting recordings. And again, that can be found under the ellipses here when you select start recording. Now, the last option that I'd like to talk about within our menu here is the ability to turn off incoming video. And when we turn off incoming video, that will prevent us from having a video uh, going out as well as us accepting video coming in. So it will essentially create an audio only conversation for us personally. Other people in our meeting will still be able to experience it exactly the same. They'll be able to use their camera. Uh, the only difference that will change is our video will no longer work. And this is a good idea if we're in a place where our Wi-Fi connection is not as stable or we're using our cellular data. We don't wanna um, use a lot of data at one point. So if we have just that audio connection, we can really save on bandwidth. Now, the last options that we have uh, available to us as a meeting organizer is we have the option to control how our meeting is ended. We have our standard leave option here, which will only remove us from our meeting and will continue that meeting runtime. 
So now that I have left, I would be able to select our meeting again, and I still see that that timer is going. So when I select rejoin, anything like attendance lists or recordings that were going before will still uh, continue because that timer is still going. However, if I were to select end meeting by selecting our drop down menu here, that will remove everyone from our meeting and will put a definitive end to any recordings or the attendance list that we may be creating. So to really highlight that here, I'm going to download an attendance list again. So we can select our participants menu, navigate to the ellipses, and then select download attendance list. That will generate an Excel file that we can open up. And here we'll see information such as uh, people have joined or left and when that happened. And this will show for our entire time frame of when our meeting started to this point. However, if I were to end our meeting and remove everyone from the meeting itself, so I navigate back here. If I were to navigate to the top, select our drop down menu and then end our meeting, that will remove absolutely everyone from the meeting. Now when we select it, we no longer have that counter. And if I were to rejoin this and download an attendance list, let's see how that looks. So now I'll go to our participants menu and I'll try to download an attendance list again. So now when we open up our attendance list after we have fully ended our meeting, it will only show us because we put an end to that runtime. We put an end to any attendance lists that we are generating, so it will not be fully um, accurate. So we'll want to be sure that we download an attendance list before everyone has left our meeting, or um, if we are going to use that end meeting option, that we download an attendance list before we select that. All right, so. Uh, we've talked a little bit about our standard Teams meetings here, all of the features that are available there. I want to highlight some of the key differences between inviting a channel to our meeting versus just having a regular Teams meeting. And the major difference between those two is where information is going to be stored. So for our standard Teams meeting, for our Outlook one, any conversations that we have or recordings that we create will be accessible via the chat area because for each regular meeting that we create in Teams, a corresponding chat is created as well, where we can access any conversations and even send af uh, messages after our meeting. We can access our whiteboard and continue editing it here if we'd like to. So any conversations or files that we upload or create are going to be stored in this chat, and that's for our regular Outlook meeting, so the one that we didn't invite a Teams channel to. If we were to check out our Teams meeting that we invited a channel to, those conversations are going to be stored in the channel that we invite. So if I were to join our, uh, our meeting that we invited our channel to here, I could select it and then select join. We'll be given the same options to adjust our video and audio settings, and then we'll select join now. And the only difference here is where our communication is going to be stored. So if I go split screen on this page here, we see in our Teams view that our timer is going and it will show the participants that are currently in our call. And if we were to send a message outside of our meeting, for example, uh, this is a message in the uh, general channel. We will see that reflected in our chat in our meeting. Perfect, right here. So we can see that reflected in our meeting and the same thing goes for uh, the opposite direction. So this could be in our meeting. Yeah, and this is a message in our meeting chat, exactly. And we can see all of those reflected in our general channel because we invited them. And if we were to say upload or share a file from our OneDrive, this is also where a key difference is going to be found. So I'm going to upload our semester recap document here. And if you notice, this will say share. So when I select this here, 
a version will be uploaded to our, um, our SharePoint here, and others will be able to access that document, open it up, and begin collaborating on it. Now, if we were to navigate over to our regular Teams meeting, the one that we created in Outlook that is connected to our standard chat, if we were to join that conversation and share a file, it will be stored in a bit of a different place. So I'll go to our conversation here. We're in our Outlook meeting, and I'm going to upload that exact same document, our semester recap worksheet. I'll select share, and that will upload here. I'm going to open this up and make a brief modification to it so that we can have it active. So I'll go to edit in Teams. Uh, I'm just going to make an edit here that is de deleting all of our content. There we are. And now if I go back to our other meeting, the one that we had for our Teams channel invite, and I go to edit this document, Oh, it is having them represented as the same one because they are already uploaded. Okay. Um, so, okay. If we go to our files area, I think this will really help to, uh, to highlight things. Let's see here, one second. Um, just ignore what I'm doing for right now. I need to adjust something so that it is actually um, storing stuff in the correct place because we invited this. So we can. Here we go. So now when we're attaching our document here, instead of saying share, it is saying upload a copy. So this is a key difference between sharing something in a meeting that is attached to a channel versus a regular Teams meeting. When we share a document that is attached to a regular Teams meeting and not shared with a channel, then we are sharing a direct link from a file on our OneDrive. However, when we are sharing a document and a meeting attached to a channel, we are actually uploading a copy. So when we upload our recap here, when we select send, if we were to open up this semester recap, uh, we will open it in Teams here. Perfect. All right, so we have this document here. I'll make a change to it real quick, just so it is up to date in our files area. Now we go to our files area. We can see that we have two of the exact same document. We have semester recap worksheet and semester recap worksheet. The difference is where they're stored. So the first one we shared was in a regular Teams meeting. And just to review, those Teams meetings store their information in a chat. So it is a private area that others will only be able to access if they have an invitation to the chat or the meeting. So that's why I have shared a direct link from my personal OneDrive. However, when we're sharing a file in a meeting that is connected to a channel, then our file will be located in that channel and has been shared as a copy. That way, anyone within that channel can select the document and make edits to it without it impacting the, the version that we have on our OneDrive. So since I've attached this document to our general channel in Algebra, anyone will be able to select this and make edits to it. But since we've uploaded a copy, those edits will not go back to the original version that I shared from my OneDrive, they will act as separate files. So what happens in one will not impact the other. So we can really have a separation between that smaller kind of one-on-one -on -one collaborative space in our regular Teams meeting and the larger collaborative space that comes with sharing a meeting directly with a channel. Now, a couple of things that I'd like to cover before we wrap up for today and uh, open the floor to any questions from all of you is uh, some of our settings. When we select our user profile here and navigate down to settings, the two areas that I'd like to talk about specifically are devices and notifications. And these are useful because in our devices area, we can control our specific speaker, our microphone, change our camera, as well as control noise suppression if we're in a particularly noisy environment. This will be on to auto by default, 
but we can adjust this to high, low, or off if we'd like to. And what's also nice about the devices area in our settings is we can make a test call. And what's nice about making a test call is it will show us a live feed of our camera, it will prompt us to record a short audio clip, and then it will play it back to us. So all in one go, it will make sure that our camera, our microphone, and our speaker are working properly, and they're working uh, up to par with what we expect for our meeting. So I definitely recommend using this make a test call option. If you are new to Teams or you've never scheduled a Teams meeting before, it's a good way of ensuring that all of your devices are working properly and you won't have any of those um, awkward can you hear me conversations when you first join your meeting. In our notifications area, I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, specifically our meeting notifications and uh, some of our notification settings in general. The first ones I'd like to highlight are showing a message preview and playing a sound for notifications. So we can turn these on or off as we'd like. And we can control notifications broken down based on where they come from. So notifications for teams and channels can be found here, chats, and then meetings. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about our meeting notification settings here. So if we navigate over to edit, we have two key choices when it comes to meeting notifications. The first is a meeting start notification, and the second is notifications regarding meeting chats. For meeting start notifications, we have two options. We can either have a banner or we can turn them off. And what a banner looks like is if someone were to, uh, say, join our meeting here, uh, we'll say, we'll have Alex join a meeting real quick. If we were to join our meeting, um, I actually need to end the meetings that I'm currently in here. All right, so if uh, Alex were to try to join our Outlook meeting here, and he were the one that's trying to start the meeting, we'll select join now, and we'll receive a notification about the specific meeting that has started, the name of the person who is trying to start the meeting, as well as options to message the meeting directly, and join our meeting directly. So this is what's called a banner notification, and you'll see that option pop up pretty frequently in all of our notification settings. So a, a banner is going to look just like that. And our next option is meeting chat notifications. And these notifications are going to count for any meeting that we have on our calendar, no matter if we're added as a required or an optional attendee, which is why it's important that we customize this because we can choose to have all messages unmuted so that we'll be notified about any chat that is sent in any meeting that's on our calendar. We can have all meeting chats muted if we'd like to, or we can have this middle ground where they will be muted until we either join or first send a message in that meeting. And I recommend selecting this one because if you do get invited to a lot of meetings, there's, uh, it's, it's really likely that you're not going to attend or be active in all of those. So it's not really necessary for us to receive notifications about chats that happen there. When we select this middle ground option, it allows us to only receive those chat notifications from a meeting that we are active in, that we have taken, uh, taken a vested interest in and are participating in. So we have either first sent a message in that meeting chat or we've actually joined the meeting. Therefore, we have let teams know that this meeting in particular is relevant to us and we want to receive information about that. All right, uh, we do have about a half hour left in our uh, our time slot today, and I do wanna leave some time for questions from all of you, because uh, we have gotten a lot of fantastic ones as we've gone throughout our training today. Uh, one thing as well is we do have a, a survey that will be posted to the featured section of your Q&A. Uh, we really appreciate your feedback on these trainings and we aim for nines and tens. So if there is anything that you enjoyed about this training or something that you'd like to see in a future training, that's the perfect place to let us know. We really appreciate your feedback and um, we'll be opening up the floor to any and all questions that you have. Uh, if you don't have any questions, we'll give you some time back in your day. Uh, I do wanna say thank you for joining us on behalf of myself, our Microsoft team and our amazing partners at OSU. Uh, thank you for joining us. Please fill out a survey. We really appreciate it, and I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. At this point, I'll check in with our moderators, see if there are any questions that we have or any sort of uh, remaining concepts that we wanted to go back and review before we uh, 
open up the floor to any questions, kind of put on some music and wind down our live event for today. Are there any questions that we have so far or things that we'd like to review? We seem to be doing all right for the moment. Uh, there were just some little eccentricities between the different versions of uh, why isn't my window snap working? Why, why can't I zoom in or out on uh, content? That kind of thing. Gotcha. Yep. Um, so just to kind of clarify all of that, it is going to depend on the platform that you're on um, and your specific hardware settings. So whether you are using a mouse with a track or with a scroll wheel, or if you're using the trackpad on your computer, um, it, it is going to take a little bit of practice to figure out how those specific things work. Um, but they should the features should be available across all of the devices, no matter what hardware set you have. It's really just going to depend on how you have those settings configured and figuring out how to kind of activate that specific setting. Um, if there are not any other questions currently, uh, we'll put on some music in the background. We'll keep an eye on that Q&A and continue to answer any questions that you may have as those come in. Uh, if there's anything that you'd like to see redemonstrated, this is the perfect time to let us know. Uh, and we will uh perfect okay actually it looks like we just got a question in uh we'd like to show how we got the powerpoint placed in the tray in the meeting so it was ready to present and in order to do that we'll go ahead and transition back here so in order to get a powerpoint added to that space we will need to upload it So if we go to our share content option here, we have our PowerPoints. To add a PowerPoint to this space, we can select browse and then share one from our computer or from OneDrive. So if I select OneDrive here and upload our title presentation, I can select share and that will begin uploading it and presenting it to our meeting. At that point, in a, uh, the, the PowerPoint will be available in the list here and we'll be able to access it later. When we upload that file, it will be store it will be stored in our files area on Teams, so we can access that from our OneDrive, upload from our computer, or the files area within Teams directly. Uh, looks like we also have a request here to um show how we can rewind the training session and show uh, the slowdown step by step uh, absolutely i can do that uh just one second here we'll want to go back to the beginning and here we are all right so if you would like to review any of the content that we have uh talked about today or you'd like to rewind it all you can select the slider that is in a bar right here um, that will allow you to rewind to any point and you can adjust your playback speed here as well. If you'd like to return to the live portion of the training, you can select the live option down at the corner and that will return you to uh, the main area the, uh, or the, the, the current portion of our training. So those PowerPoints that appear on the right side of the share tray, Mm -hmm. have been uploaded previously to your teams either either to your channel or to your personal onedrive how does that work where do they yep so the I... ones that populate here are going to be ones that i have interacted with recently in other meetings so these don't necessarily mean that i've uploaded them directly to this meeting uh it simply means that they have been uploaded to teams and i've interacted with them recently uh, so we do have the option to browse and then upload from our computer or OneDrive, at which point that PowerPoint will be added to our category here uh, and will be available in other meetings because we will at that point have accessed it recently. So I'm seeing a blank screen. Oh, sorry, my bad. There we are. Oh, way better. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> um, so when we when we have these uploaded here it just simply means that we've interacted with them recently uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that we have uploaded them directly to this meeting if we select the browse option and then upload from our computer or share from onedrive that will upload it to teams but not directly to this meeting so it will be added to this category it's just uh it will be added simply because we have then recently interacted with it uh, when we are trying to access any of these files, they're not actually shared directly with that meeting. They are instead found in our files area. 
so we can see here that the title PowerPoint is technically still stored in my OneDrive. It hasn't actually been shared with any um, any presentation or any meeting at all. It's if we went to the chat for this meeting, for example, we went to files. Um, the PowerPoint is not stored there. We're simply sharing it directly from our OneDrive, but we're not giving access to it. Uh, hopefully that clarifies it a little bit. Um, so just to kind of summarize that, it's not something that you have to recently upload to your meeting itself. These will be listed based on ones that you have interacted with recently. Um, if you don't see a specific PowerPoint listed here that you would like to show, then you can browse from your computer or your OneDrive to begin sharing it directly with your meeting. But just know that presenting it or selecting the browse option here is not the same as attaching it to your meeting or sharing the file as we have with this Word document or as you would by selecting the paperclip option to upload from your computer or from OneDrive. Hopefully that clarifies it a little bit. Um, if you do have any more specific questions regarding that, I'd be happy to explain a little bit more. Um, but yeah, hopefully that, that addresses that for you. Uh, how does one integrate OneNote with a Teams meeting? Fantastic question. Great question. Um, we can either invite, uh, as we did in our Outlook invitation, we can attach a OneNote invitation. So in our Outlook um, option here, we had attached a meeting invitation for our meeting notes here. So by selecting the OneNote option at the top of our meeting page, we can select the meeting notes option and begin sharing out notes with our meeting. Alternatively, and uh, probably a, a easier to access way, would be to go directly to our meeting chat and then add in a tab to represent OneNote. So when we select the plus icon at the top of our meeting chat, we can select the plus icon and we'll search for OneNote here. This will give us the option to attach a specific OneNote to this, and we'll attach, say, our uh, physical science notebook. I'll select Save. Um, does not support class or no. Okay, so that's a class or staff notebook. We will attach our personal one here then. I'll select Save, and that will add it as a new tab that others will be able to access. So we can have this tab here, and as long as it's added as a tab, others will be able to select it and interact with the OneNote page. So hopefully uh, that makes sense there. We can we can attach that one note and um, interact with it there, or we can share it out directly in our Outlook invitation. All right, looks like our Q&A is relatively clear for now. So we'll go ahead and put on some music. Uh, we will have an announcement at the end of our event when we'll be wrapping up, um, but for, be sure to keep those questions coming. We're happy to answer anything or redemonstrate anything that you are curious about. Mm -hmm.